Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, second part session, securing long-term patient options for those with uh, severe aortic stenosis. Many of you will have joined our session yesterday evening, and we're hoping to build on some of those concepts that we addressed during that session. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, in this hybrid environment. My name's Phil McCarthy, I work at King's in London, and I'm here with my uh, friends and colleagues, David Wood and Bernard Prendergast. Um, and we're also waiting for Sergio Berti to join us, and I'm sure he'll be along in a minute. And we have a remote discussant, Jörg Kempfer from Berlin, to help us with some of the issues that we're going to be addressing. So just to remind those of, those of you who were, and also those who weren't in our session yesterday, we, we started talking about the importance of treating aortic stenosis with a really good first procedure. And, and we made the point that if the heart team decides that it's a surgical AVR that the patient should get, then you've got to in, ensure things like coronary access and getting a durable bioprosthesis uh, so that you can be thinking about the next step uh, in the patient's pathway. Now, if TAVI is a preferred treatment option, we made the points that you've really got to optimize that procedure using a Sapien 3 Ultra, if you can, with the benchmark program. We had a very nice demonstration of the benchmark program from Mark Spence and colleagues in Belfast. Um, and and we, 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 we looked beyond the index procedure. So we made the point that you've got to be thinking about the next intervention, even when you do your index intervention. And we talked briefly about conduction disturbances, both with surgical intervention and, and TAVI as well, and the impact that they might have on people in the long term. So in this session today, we're going to be uh, addressing patients with longer life expectancy and thinking about what you do uh, when the first procedure starts to fail. So what do we do about durability? What do we do about coronary access? And if your bioprosthesis, whatever it is, fails, uh, how you f perform a valve-in-valve -valve procedure and what are the challenges of some of those issues? So here is my faculty. We're joined by Sergio. Welcome, Sergio coming in here. Uh, and I'm going to hand over in a second to Bernard to talk about the chat function that you'll all hopefully be using. So if we just look at the learning objectives of our, of our session today, we're hoping that we will be able to discuss how to understand uh, the key criteria at the time of the first intervention and to build on that to learn about the uh, appropriate patients to select for both aortic and mitral valve and valve procedures and also drill down on some of the tips and tricks for those valve and valve procedures. So maybe it's, it's a good time to hand over to Bernard to talk about the chat function and how you can get involved in interacting with the session. Bernard. So thanks very much, Phil, and um, I'm sure that most of you in the audiences, both here in the studio and online, are now familiar with the setup. But just to remind everybody that if you are here in the studio, you should submit any questions via the app. And as Phil has already said, those online can put their questions through the chat function. And Victoria Delgado is our chat master for this session. She'll be facilitating the interaction online. And of course, we will bring the key questions and the key themes here into the, uh, the main arena studio. So our first speaker is going to be David Wood. David, as many of you will know, was involved in some of the first TAVI procedures in Vancouver, Canada many years ago, and has therefore himself shown considerable durability in the field. <laughs> and what he's going to talk about us today is what matters in the long term the durability of transcatheter heart valves and their physiological performance. Wow, it feels so good to be in person here, but also virtually. I'm wearing a brand new scarf to show that I'm actually in London. And uh, to Bernard and Sergio and Phil, thank you so much for being here. So I think there's my slides, I love it. Uh, what matters in the long term? So my relevant disclosures. So you have to start with a quote. What we do now echoes in eternity. So you can look at the program here, the program at TCT, and lifetime management of severe symptomatic aortic stenosis has become the hottest topic. When or if to perform repeat TAVI using all the different platforms. Whereas two years ago, I think we all thought we can just focus on some of these other valves now, it's now become clear that THV and THV, whatever the modeling, is gonna become a significant part of our lives in the coming years. 
I could show you all sorts of the existing evidence, one year, three year, five years, eight years, um, all sorts of modeling about Saver or Tavi first. But I think the long and short of it is depending on the platform and depending on the patient, we just need to wait for that data to come in to truly see are these valves going to be similar to surgical bioprosthesis? Are they gonna last eight, 10, 12 years beyond? There's a lot of comorbidities, some biomarkers that might predict which valves are going to fail when, but again, that evidence needs to evolve. I've had the fortunate opportunity with John Webb and Jannar and some of my colleagues to work with, I think, 140 different sites with that benchmark program. We saw that beautiful video last night with Mark uh, Spence. And what I can tell you is there are amazing sites throughout Europe, throughout the world that are achieving 1% mortality, stroke, vascular complications, very short length of stay, single digit pacemaker rates, very low readmission rates, which is fabulous. But unless we add another variable, which is making sure in 8, 10, 12 years that patient can have a repeat THV and THV, I don't think we are doing that patient the full service. Some other exciting you know, hot topics that came out. You can see the Protect Taver logo that we presented at TCT last week with the little coronavirus. Some centers now, 5% of cases, one in 20 cases at seven sites during the pandemic, 124 cases, are done same day to prevent stress on the system during COVID. These are incredibly, I don't wanna use the word sexy, but exciting topics. Um, but again, unless we're thinking about what's gonna to happen to that patient in the future, I don't think we're doing our patient a full service. So I'm gonna chat. We know we have the SMART trial and we're participating in that um, in Vancouver, but I think we now need to look at prospective data to figure out when and if to perform repeat TAVI and TAVI procedures. So I'm gonna chat about discordance TAVR and complete TAVR briefly. So I had the opportunity yesterday, thank you to the PCR London Valves Organizing Committee to present uh, as a late breaker the discordance TAVR uh, pilot study. And this is on behalf of my co-PI, Amara Boss, John Webb, uh, Philippe Pibaru, uh, Marty Leon, and others. So I think it's clear that with native aortic stenosis, there is beautiful concordance between echocardiography-derived and direct invasive measurements. But as soon as you put a bioprosthesis in, whether it's transcatheter or surgical, it's a scatter plot. And this is not new. We've rediscovered something that we've known about for 35 years. So then the question is, how does this impact patients? And my colleague, uh, co-PI Amara Boss, has done some very elegant work, multiple publications in the last 24 months, looking at immediately post-TAVI, the discordance between echo and direct invasive measurements in different THV platforms, as well as small, medium, large annuli. But the question that came up with us and our co-investigators, John, myself, is could a hybrid approach, utilizing both echo and direct invasive measurements, more accurately predict the need for this coming growing phenomenon of TAV in TAV, and thus the discordance TAVR study. So this is the algorithm we used for discordance TAVR, and now we've incorporated it into complete TAVR. I'll talk about that momentarily. On repeat echocardiography, that's key. This is never just a single measurement, but on repeat echocardiography, elevated gradient or VARC3 criteria for hemodynamic valve deterioration, we do a CT. CT is the gatekeeper. If on CT there is no evidence of valve thrombosis or HALT, we then would bring those patients back, whether it's three months post-TAVI or 10 years post-TAVI, for invasive hemodynamics with a simultaneous on-table echo, so they're in the same fluid state, and right heart catheterization. The technique is described in the manuscript. Uh, we've used all different catheters, but for reproducibility, one pigtail deep in the LV without any ectopy, three samples, one centimeter above the frame, three samples at the arch so that you can assess invasive pressure recovery, and then we just look. If there's concordance, so elevated on echo, elevated invasively, and with the hemodynamic parameters, then maybe that patient does require a repeat intervention, whether that's dilation or a repeat THV and THV. But if there's discordance, and this was where this all came from in the last two years, we would suggest that that patient's valve is behaving appropriately and they do not need a re-intervention and they can be followed as per normal standard of care. 
So the essential results in the Vanguard study, the initial 13 patients, you can see the criteria, the echo criteria, CT again showing no evidence of leaflet thrombosis or HALT, consensus by the heart team that it's appropriate to bring that patient back for invasive hemodynamics with simultaneous echo. The average age 80, NYHA class two or one, these were elective outpatients. The results. So in midterm follow-up in 13 patients, uh, there's a six millimeter mercury difference between echo and invasive gradients when done meticulously with a simultaneous on-table echo, with echo on the left and uh, invasive gradients on the right on the scatter plot there on the right-hand side. What did that mean for the patients? If you start with echo, and again, this is repeat echo as per Philippe Pibereau done with appropriate windows for evaluating a bioprosthesis, all 13 patients had a mean gradient greater than 20. Five met for moderate VARC dysfunction. When we do the invest invasive, you can see the number that are reclassified. All five then no longer met for moderate. And what happened with the outcome? I'll draw your attention to that red box. Three out of the four who had concordance, i.e. the echo is elevated, the invasive hemodynamics matched in midterm follow-up went for a re-intervention. Um, the remainder remained largely asymptomatic. And this is, uh, was a simultaneously published publis, uh, publi <laughs> publication with our presentation yesterday morning. See, I got so excited there, I couldn't even say the words. And in that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the nine centers that are participating in the Discordance Tavera results. We're analyzing the data on all 50 patients, and that will be available hopefully in the first quarter of 2022. But I don't think that's enough. We need data sooner. And so we've actually changed Complete Taver. So for those that know Complete Taver, it's 106 sites currently in North America. I'm advocating strongly to include 20 sites in our wonderful colleagues across the sea. And what I would say is, this is a busy slide, but I will just highlight four key points. One, 4,000 patients. Very large TAVI study. All have concomitant coronary disease, at least a 70% stenosis in one artery. All 4,000 of successful transfemoral TAVR, and then they get randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either revascularization or not. Fine, that will be available in 2026. But what we've done to complete TAVR, if we've added in invasive hemodynamics at the time of TAVI in all 4,000 with invasive hemodynamics, right heart catheterization, and uh, simultaneous on-table echo. And then any time during the median three and a half year follow-up, if that echo gradient is elevated, or they um, meet for VARC, moderate uh, hemodynamic valve deterioration, they come back. And I think those parameters tied with hard outcomes in a long-term study are going to be pivotal. And we've got a sub-study within the stage PCI group, at least in the 16 Canadian centers, that hopefully will be available in about 18 months, which I think will inform practice. Because this is all about, this is my final slide, what we do now, November 2021, is crucial. And we must be thinking about that second THV and THV procedure. We must know how to follow these patients and make sure either that we're not missing a patient who does have deterioration or that we're inappropriately putting a valve or doing a repeat procedure when we don't need to. So stay tuned for the discordance TAVR results. And this ability to clarify the need for valve reintervention, I would say, is now one of the hottest topics in structural heart disease. Phil, thank you so much. David, thank you. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. And, and I know that Bernard is furiously writing down your questions coming in from the chat. We do have an opportunity to, to discuss them. But uh, in, in the, for the interest of time, we're going to go straight to your Kempfert in Berlin, who's going to not only tell us about the challenges of aortic valve and valve procedures, but also then introduce uh, his case, which is a, a, a live in the box recorded case from the German Heart Center. So Jörg, uh, tell us about uh, aortic valve and valve procedures. Yeah, welcome, uh, my pleasure. So I would like to touch on the potential challenges of aortic uh, valve and valve procedures. Okay, so obviously um, there are many kind of configurations that you could think about where you could put in a valve and valve, be it transcatheter and transcatheter in the aortic mitral or transcatheter in a failed surgical valve. Now, one uh, known fact is that with each layer, the residual internal diameter is going to become smaller. I think this is uh, the one that is easy to understand. And this is why it's very important if you get started with these procedures to know your valve that is in position. 
And most of us know the Valve and Valve uh, app, originally designed by Vinnie Babat, which is going to give you all the details you're going to need of the different surgical valves, or also transcatheter valves that you might came, come across. On the other side, you can see the Vivid Calculator, which is a very handy tool that's going to help you to predict whether or not you might face the problem of uh, PPM down the road. Now, touching uh, briefly on coronary access, um, I think it is obvious that with a balloon expandable sapient platform, as long as you stay below the coronaries, there's not uh, uh, much problem to be expected, uh, not either for uh, access to coronary, but also not in case of you think of a future valve and valve and valve. However, the minute you go with self-expandable devices that are going to cover uh, the coronary osteos and more importantly, the sinuses, then also um, the height of the skirt, height of the leaflet, and more importantly, the potential for anatomical rotation uh, come into play. Now, once again, this is a CT-based study showing uh, the um, potential impact of a valve and valve for future valve and valve procedures. And you can see the um, red columns here uh, in case of a sapien as they're going to stay subcoronary, no problem to be expected there. And this is why, in my personal opinion, this is a very good choice for especially the younger patients. Now, moving from coronary access to potential uh, PPM, this is a much more complex issue. And we all know that um, uh, Danny Vier published 2014 this paper where they grouped the patient based on the surgical valve label size. And you can see the patient that started in with a small surgical valve had a, a worse uh, long term uh, survival. Now, in contrast, if you now look at the data from the Sapien 3 20 millimeter valve, uh, you can see that, yes, the gradient have been ill elevated and also, yes, there have been higher incident of PPM, but in contrast, there was absolutely no impact uh, detectable in terms to one year uh, mortality. And furthermore, if you have a look on another summary, you again see the same picture here. Balloon expandable valves tend to have a slightly elevated gradient and, yes, theoretically, they tend to have a, a slightly higher rate of PPM, but again, the hazard rate for mortality is absolutely not different. So I think the picture is not fully understood yet. It also could be that there's an issue with the measurement of the EOA, how we do it. So uh, take home messages. Yes, PPM and elevated grade have been seen with especially small balloon expandable valve, but uh, there has been no link shown with increased mortality yet. In contrast, uh, this is some uh, a larger uh, summary of valve and valve data with the Sapien 3 platform summarizing more than 4,000 patients. You can see that the outcome is very good and the observed to expected mortality ratio is only 0.3%. So very good outcome uh, with the platform. This brings us to this case where I like to show you a more complex uh, valve and valve procedure in a failed Paramount 23. So I have a brief look on the patient. It's a 61 year old female, so quite young that had a Paramount 23 uh, implanted to back in 2011, some PCI to the first argon and LID. Now she's suffering also from ischemic cardiomyopathy with a uh, left ventricular end diastolic diameter of 67, so quite significant enlarged uh, ventricle. She's highly symptomatic, has a stated past uh, pacemaker and some other uh, comorbidities. So all together within the heart team, we discussed this case. We found the intermediate risk with a Euroscore 2 of 8.8% and decided to go for a valve and valve procedure in contrast to a surgical redo. And now we need to have a look on the anatomical details here. So remember, uh, we are looking at a Paramount 23 that have been implanted that uh, based on the valve and valve app is a true ID of 21 millimeters, so quite small landing zone. And uh, if we now have a look on the current accuracy, you, see, you can see the impaired left ventricular function uh, some moderate uh, might regurg that we were not going to touch. And so we had the problem that we're now facing a patient with an impaired left ventricular function, which is still young. So we want to uh, achieve two things. We definitely do not want to end with PPM. And we want to maintain access for potential valve and valve and valve in the future. So let's have a look on the coronaries. So the takeoff height is uh, both quite comfortable of 12 millimeters. And also the sinus seem to be wide enough to host a uh, uh, valve and valve. Now have a look on the transfermal axis with six millimeter. This is no problem to be expected here. But now let's uh, uh, focus more on the tricky part. Based on the valve and valve calculator, you could see that we just want to proceed with the Sapien 323, which is the suggested valve for this 21 true ID failed paramount. 
the likelihood of ending with severe PPM or relevant PPM is quite high. And this is even in, the, in this um, uh, calculator algorithm, uh, bioprosthetic valve fracturing is uh, mentioned. This is actually exactly what we're going to go for in a minute. And now we have a, have a look here on this table that most of you uh, are going to be familiar with. There's some surgical valves that you can't fracture and fortunately Paramount is one of them. And you're going to expect a burst pressure at around 20 atmosphere. And have a look at the bench simulation here that we did before the case, just listen to that crack. It just so, so here, uh, there at 20 atmosphere, typically a, a non-compliant balloon is going to able to make some room. So with this kind of a, uh, details. Let's have a look and uh, see how the case goes. So uh, obviously with the uh, valve and valve, we had cerebral emboli protection. And again, summarizing the idea, we have impaired left ventricular function. We definitely want to avoid PPM. This is why we're going to go for uh, valve fracturing. And because it's a younger patient, we want to stay subcoronary to maintain future coronary access. Hello and welcome. You've seen the case presentation a minute ago. Let's have a, a quick view on our setup. So we decided to have the patient intubated to take advantage of the TE probe because we expect a little bit challenging valve and valve procedure. Usually we do it in, uh, uh, without intubation, but I think for this case it is uh, at safety to have additional TE pictures. So it's the opposite of a straightforward 30 minute uh, TF case, but yes. you need to have you know, a mixture of cases, otherwise it's not going to re replicate real life. So this is why we added the venous and arterial safety for the ECMO standby or the uh, pump. We added the TEE to have better imaging. We added the uh, Sentinel because we cannot exclude uh, debris from the degenerative valve. Uh, and I think now we have seen the uh, control of the angio of the arch, the, everything is in place. We are ready to go. Also, if you have a brief look on the uh, heart navigator. So again, the measurement obviously the same. So we are looking here at the stent uh, diameter of 22, internal diameter, so true ID is 21. So we, if we want to put in a 23 sapien valve, and the reason why we want to use a balloon expandable is to want to maintain coronary access, and we want to maintain a lifelong concept in regard to a potential valve and valve and valve in the future because the patient is high risk but not that old. And you can see that 23 would work in the current configuration of the landing zone but based also on the vivid calculation we would end up with at least moderate PPM which is something that especially in a reduced ejection fraction is something absolutely to be avoided. So now let's have a look on the 26 and the 26 obviously is an upsizing to get rid of PPN, but we need to make room for it. And you can see that the root uh, is large enough, so we do not expect problems here. But obviously, we need to, yeah, we need to kind of uh, convince the existing uh, stand frame of the surgical valve implanted to give us a little bit more room. There are new prosthesis on the market that are built for that, designed for that, like the Inspirus. This is uh, an older model that we need to uh, make room for. So we use a high pressure. Now I think we need to prepare the landing zone. So we have the 24 uh, true dilatation balloon ready. We have two syringes uh, attached so that we can really create pressure. We expect something above 20. OK, rapid pacing on. And there we inflate. And ah, there it goes. See okay. on the left side? Up. There we go. And pacing aus, bitte. So again, I guess we need to kind of discuss now the uh, implant technique. Um, well, we decided for a sapien. Um, I think we want um, the sapien so it doesn't compromise the coronary access um, for the lifetime concept and that the uh, uh, leaflets of the sapien will not occlude um, uh, the coronaries in valve and valve. So our um, implant technique will not be very, very, very high. Um, and usually, uh, the sapien valve uh, shortens about two-thirds from the LV uh, and one-third from the aortic side, uh, which is in valve and valve procedure not very often the case because it, it anchors very fast in the stand frame and then the, foreshort the shortening is, isn't as expected. So you need to start higher okay. um, than, than, than normal. Okay. Should uh, I do it? Yeah, I think this is yeah. good. Okay, we do it. Okay, all in, all in, all in. Release. And pacer off. 
So, Chris, I think the, the height of the implant is as planned. We see a little bit of kind of a still of a waste in the stent, which uh, is due to the recoil effect. So this is why we decided to to post dilate, but not with the full pressure. This is what is how we already have done uh, before. So only kind of a soft inflation to. Uh, uh, remodel everything a little bit. And especially it's a 26 sapien, so if we go with the 24 balloon, yes. when it opens completely, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too harmful. Okay, so let's go for it. Phaser ready. Phaser is on. No output and inflate. That looks very nice. It's definitely straightening on the sides. OK. And deflate. Face is off. OK, let's see how the gradients and the echo and the angel look. Huh? So Christoph, I think this, uh, the concept worked very well. There's no gradient. Uh, peak to peak is uh, four. Yeah, so nothing, right? It's good, perfect. So let's uh, do a final angio. OK, very good. So there is actually no uh, power valve lag, as most of the time, or almost always in valve and valve. Also, we stayed uh, below the corners, bearing in mind that the uh, distal part of the sapien stand is not covered. For the lifetime concept, even if you do a valve and valve procedure now, valve and valve and valve, um, I think the, the valve from the, from the sapien will still not be occlusive, uh, occlusive to, yes. the, to, the, to the coronaries. That, so uh, that was the concept, and I think yes. uh, the concept worked quite, quite well. And there's a full, full expansion of, of, of the 26 uh, sapien. I don't think that we're going to have early deterioration due to no. under expansion. Um, I think the result is, uh, is good. We have no gradient. There's no patient uh, prosthesis mismatch. Yeah, so it's quite uh, surprising, almost amazing, that the concept really works, right? We, we started with a true ID of 21, and now we have a fully expanded, uh, with only a little bit of a waste visible, 26 in position. So, so we gained five millimeters. And there's no harm due to the anterior yes. mitral leaflet? No, no harm there. And also maybe one final short access view and uh, uh, to, to see whether or not uh, with that uh, slight post dilation to, to really optimize the stand expansion. Uh, we also do not did any damage to the leaflet. And also, because we fractured the valve with the high pressure before we implanted, the pre dilatation was only very mild. I think we had uh, atmos 10 or uh, 10, maximum 12 yeah. uh, atmosphere, so not, not the full power that you would need initially to crack uh, the valve stand. Looks perfect. OK, I guess this is it. Uh, thanks to the team, as usual and have a nice remaining Congress. Fracturing of the paramount prosthesis, no further work event. Uh, and with that, this case was very successful. So I'd like to summary, uh, we do expect a growing number of valve and valve procedures. Uh, it is important to understand the dimension of the sinus of Asalva as well as the design of the different transcatheter valves that could be used. A true severe PPM is extremely rare, the sapient prosthesis, um, and in uh, addition, I think it is important to understand the concept of PPM following surgical AVR, and we have seen a potential uh, workaround for those cases. And in summary, the valve and valve procedure with Sapien 3 platform is feasible and safe, and it's both C-marked for uh, aortic as well as for the mitral position. Thanks for your attention. Jorg, that was... That was uh, a, a fantastic case, Jorga. Thank you very much to you and, and your colleagues for, for uh, a case which I think uh, really captures the essence of this session in a lot of attention paid to hemodynamics, to coronary access, to real optimization. And, uh, and that is exactly what, what the message of this session is. Now, I know uh, the, the iPad is red hot there, Bernard. Uh, why don't we start with our colleagues online and in the audience with some questions coming in? Yeah, thanks, Phil. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, comments emphasizing the importance of this issue and the fact that uh, colleagues are really engaging with it in a major way. Hiteshi Chauhan has been uh, particularly uh, vociferous and keen on promoting this concept of the lifetime journey. 
And David, thanks for presenting the results of Discordance Tavi. I mean, it's a really important study. It makes us think, rethink, which is always uh, healthy. Um, and it makes me think about the fact that we are perhaps not paying enough attention uh, sometimes as to get the best hemodynamic outcome at the time of the first implant. You've got a study that's looking for the problem at midterm, but what can we do to address it when we implant the valve front up? I think that's a fabulous question. First off, beautiful case. That was yeah, a really, really a nice case. case, so thank you for sharing. Uh, I'll be honest, John and myself had gotten away from doing routine hemodynamics um, just because we didn't think it was crucial, and then it became very, very clear that we must, and we must just not do it quickly. It must be standardized. It doesn't take more than three or five minutes extra. We're doing it in all 4,000 patients in complete TAVR. That combined with an on-table echo, and I'll be honest, we got away from doing the on-table simultaneous echo as well. Um, we do five cases, you know, like you, between 7.30 and 4 in the afternoon, and we're used to that. But it doesn't take. With a little bit of extra planning, again, doing the on-table echo with the simultaneous hemodynamics really does set you up for success. Obviously, short vein prosthesis is one of the advantages here, and I think um, that should be standard of care globally, full stop. We, yeah. we've, we've taken a view that we need to be more sophisticated in our analysis of the CT. You know, we want to put the largest valve in, a bit like we encourage our surgeons to yeah. do, but we, we need to look beyond just the annular dimensions. We need to look at the STJ height, the bulk of the leaflets, the degree of calcification, and without running the risk of annular rupture, of course, but to put in the largest valve that you can at the time of the TAVI implant. Would you agree? Just like we heard last night from Enrique and, and that, that it's crucial for the surgeons to put the largest valve. I mean, that's a fascinating case, yeah. right? 50-year-old, yeah. got a bioprosthetic valve. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that for hours, but I think it behooves us to put in the right platform for the right patient, the right anatomy and comorbidities. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of our colleagues would be slightly worried at being that aggressive with dilating a valve in, in valve. And, and I'd like to pick up that point, Bernard, of, of assessing when it's safe to go that, that aggressively. Maybe you're, you can tell us, you know, some, some people would have been a bit scared with a really high pressure um, valve cracking pre and post dilatations. How do you gain confidence that you won't damage the annulus? Is it the sinus dimension? Is it the distribution of calcium? Is it the LVOT uh, dimension? What was it about this case that made you feel we've really got to put a 26 in and take it, gain four millimeters of, of uh, annular diameter? So honestly, when I first heard about this fracturing of the uh, surgical bioprosthesis back I don't know, a couple of years ago, I really couldn't believe that uh, this is going to be safe. And then uh, on my search for, to, to uh, find a suitable balloon, I asked the pediatric department and it turned out that they are doing it uh, since forever. So they are very used to fracture valves in a pulmonic position. So in other words, it's just, it, it looks scary, scary in the first place, but it seems to be very safe. I've not heard about a case that uh, where the root got injured, but as you mentioned, obviously we are going to have a close look on a CT scan and it's both the LVOT um, and as well as the sinus that is going to uh, allow us to expand there. But again, it sounds scary, but I'm not aware of any problems that has been caused by this technique. So careful pre-procedural planning and an understanding of the problems. Bernard, more questions? Yeah, so Jörg, there's some important questions for you in relation to overall surgical strategy. We've got a question here from Dr. Dr. Mackey, who's wondering whether the fact that we can now do valve-in-valve -valve TAVI with confidence, is that now pushing surgeons even more to avoiding mechanical valves and using bioprostheses in younger and younger patients beyond the current paradigm? So to be honest, it's more the patients that are leaning towards the bioprosthesis. So uh, I'm still a fan of mechanical valves for very young patients, let's say uh, younger than 50, but typically the patients are requesting uh, the bioprosthetic solution. And this is why now having these tools at hand is also uh, easier to talk with these patients because now we know that there is at least a valve and valve and a valve and valve procedure down the road. If we start with a suitable, large enough procedures in the index procedure. And there's a related question that comes from Victoria Delgado, which is about sequencing. So what do we know at this early stage about doing SAVA after TAVI? 
have been doing Sava after Tavi? If this yeah, is not so, so Tavi is the first intervention, and then <laughs> either because of early failure or later durability issues, how easy or difficult is it to do a Sava after a Tavi procedure? Doing a Sava after Tavi procedure, as long as it is, let's say, a balloon expandable, it's not that hard. After self-expandable, uh, you never know whether or not uh, stuff is healed in with the aorta. So I don't get the, the rationale why you would start with the tower and then do the sava later on. And from my understanding, it does make sense to first get out the calcium, do the surgical procedure where the patient is still young, so risk is low, and then implant a nice platform without any calcification where you can get started with your valve and valve procedures. But it is not so hard to do surgically. David wants to come in there. So just two kind of thoughts here. Thought provoking before we move along. Um, Right now, if you look globally, the number of THV and THV pr procedures is tiny, two, three hundred in the registry. Um, the surgical explant data for removing and doing surgery after TAVI, it's obviously high risk, but that will evolve. But I think if you ask patients currently what they're going to be willing to do 10 years from now, um, I just find it hard to believe that surgery is really going to be um, something they're going to be interested in. Right now, if there's 3% redo surgery and 1% THV and THV, 98% is medical management because yeah. the patients we did were partner three, partner yeah. two, high risk, elderly patients. We're just not going to have yeah. that same option in low risk patients when they're 80 yeah. and they're having their second procedure. I think that's the, that's yeah. the issue, isn't it? It's the patient risk. No. So you're coming back to you. Heath Adams is with us from Tasmania, and he wanted to know about the, the timing of the balloon cracking, mm. the valve fracture. I think you did it pre and post uh, TAVI implant in your case. We've had some pretty nasty uh, experiences with severe aortic regurg after uh, valve cracking without a TAVI in situ. What, what's, your, what's your overall strategy? Yeah, so it's not so easy to answer because you, you balance two different risk uh, kind of groups. So if we do the valve cracking first, as we did in this case, then obviously you are not going to touch the freshly implanted uh, leaflets of the new valve. The, the kind of the post dilatation that we did had only a very kind of low pressure. It was just there to overcome the recoil coil of the previously fractured uh, bioprosthesis. But you're fully right. The danger that you can uh, could face there is that after the fracturing, you might have significant uh, aortic regurgitation. This is why we had a safety wire already in place to crush on the pump in, if required. In, in the opposite, if you first implant your Tavi valve and then do the fracturing, then all the force of the balloon is going to be um, uh, applied to the new leaflets, which also can cause potential problems. So two options, but both have their shortcomings. And uh, Dr. Doris Zoroskowski from uh, London has also commented about the need for more data in this area, valve fracturing, registries, maybe some uh, comparison data with, with uh, non-cracking interventions. David? So yes, I think many have been advocating for that data because we're all victims of our last cases. John and yeah. I had a couple of cases where we fractured first that went sideways, and so we fracture yeah. after. So yeah. It's a balance of risks. And then a final kind of summating question is about uh, emphasizing firstly the, the importance of patient prosthesis mismatch, particularly in women uh, who have often have a smaller aortic annulus. Leonard Conradi has highlighted an ongoing trial, the Lighten trial, which is uh, looking at balloon expandable versus self-expanding valve technologies in patients with a small aortic annulus, 23 millimeters or less. Uh, uh, with uh, needing a valve-in-valve -valve intervention. And um, also the question really of how seriously we need to take patient prosthesis mismatch as an entity. So Sergio, could, could you tell us broadly, is, in your practice, is patient prosthesis mismatch a big worry? Is it something that you actively manage? Uh, I think that the, the problem of the mismatch is, as mentioned it correctly, is uh, the patient with the uh, small annulus, especially in women. And I think the fracture probably is the, this part of patient uh, can benefit of the, of the fracture. Because the problem uh, with the large annulus is not so critical. The main problem are patients with the small annulus, and especially women. And uh, this technique, I think, this uh, probably see the main area of application in this kind of patient. 
I, okay. my, my opinion is that the, the, the fracture before maybe is best because my, 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 my issue is when we post delayed, what is the mechanical effect on the leaflets and what is the mechanical effect in the long term on the leaflets? I think we all worry about it, but, but we're all aware the literature is not all that tight about the correlation of, of, of patient prosthesis mismatch in the TAVI population uh, in terms of correlation to poor outcomes. So I think there's a few unknowns there. We worry about it in principle, but the literature doesn't demonstrate a real mortality disadvantage. But on the other hand, it is clearly a, a major problem for specific patients, and we'll highlight yeah. that in the guidelines session this afternoon, a yeah. quick, uh, quick pitch quick there for, for this that. afternoon's main arena session. So, okay. Phil, back to you. Yes, thanks, Bernard. Brilliant. There's almost too much to discuss in the time, but we, because of time, unfortunately, we have to move on, and uh, we're going to change valves now. Uh, we're going to move into the mitral space. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Sergio to the lectern, who is going to, to take us now on a journey of mitral valve-in-valve -valve intervention uh, and, and talk to us about some of the peri- and post-procedural challenges. Uh, thank you, Phil, Sergio, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I have a slide. Oh, okay. Um, the increasing use of the bioprosthesis in cardiac surgery, especially for the mitral valve replacement, uh, 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 pond a question about uh, the durability, uh, as mentioned before, and the need of a patient of uh, for the reoperation. Unfortunately, especially for young patients, unfortunately, the uh, risk of mortality for the operation is quite high. Uh, the um, literature report the, the, the its range from 6.3 to 15 percent. So the uh, research to alternative treatments. Uh, less invasive uh, with less mortality is a clinical need. Uh, basically, we have uh, two uh, main approach for the mitral valve in valve. Uh, of course, the, to, to place a THV inside a, a bioprosthesis in mitral position is attractive. Uh, the uh, transapical approach that is uh, more comfortable for the, uh, for the physician because the apex of the left ventricle is just in front of the mitral valve, but the mortality reported with this kind of approach is quite high. Uh, the transeptal approach is more complex because the procedure requires more first step, uh, further step, but uh, the mortality is relatively low. And uh, uh, some study, uh, currently we don't have uh, uh, any randomized study, but we have a good registry, uh, show a high technical success, low uh, procedural uh, rates of complication, low mortality, and good outcome in the medium, uh, and, uh, um, in the medium time. The, uh, this is valid only for selected patient. Uh, the, the gray line shows the trend of uh, valve mitral valve and valve procedure. And the blue line is the transeptal approach. The red line, the uh, transapical approach. The message of uh, this slide is clear. The uh, operator's preference is toward the transeptal approach. Uh, it's my ple pleasure to share with you this case example is live in the box. I introduce you an 88-year-old patient. It's a female, systemic arterial pressure, uh, permanent atrofibrillation, this lipidemia in the 1981. Uh, she received a mitral commissurotomy and in 2012 an aortic replacement with sutureless valve, so, sorry, Percival M, mitral valve replacement with metronic mosaic 29 valve, and tricuspid anuloplasty with metronic contour number 28 ring. In 2020, uh, the, the patient was admitted in our hospital uh, with severe cardiac failure due to a mitral prosthesis dysfunction. Uh, this is the uh, risk of, uh, on, according to the STS score, the uh, risk of mortality is extremely high. So the patient was discussed in our team and was proposed for the transfertal multivalve uh, uh, mitral uh, procedure. Uh, the first step when we have to decide to, to propose a patient for this kind of operation is to evaluate correctly the, 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 the anatomy. Uh, this is the trans uh, thoracic echo that shows a severe mitral regurgitation, severe mitral stenosis due to the generation of the bioprosthesis. The 3D transesophageal echocardiography show clearly the impairment of the leaflets, and the 2D show the eccentric severe regurgitation with a, a prolapse of one limb. Um, the CT scan provides all the information uh, for the, uh, to clarify the, the anatomy of the patient. Uh, we see a severe 
left atrium dilatation with the ro clockwise rotation of the whole heart. In red, we see the uh, site of uh, transeptal puncture. In uh, uh, green, the uh, annulus of the uh, my bi bioprosthesis. Uh, the second step after the anatomy is uh, to know the technical aspect of the, of the valve. We have to know the valve in which we have to implant the uh, THV because we need uh, an appropriate sizing, a correct positioning, and uh, to evaluate, this is extremely important, to evaluate the risk of LVOT obstruction. Uh, let's see the technical aspects of the uh, Metronic Mosaic 29. Uh, the valve is completely uh, transparent to the fluoro. We see only the three markers uh, on the tip of the post. Uh, the only level for a good anchoring in the valve is at the level of the semi ring because the post doesn't provide, uh, don't provide uh, any, uh, any support because they are elastic. The internal diameter of the valve is 20 xi. We have to, to check exactly the internal diameter, not the, the number of the valve, and the height of the valve is 20.5. According to the sizing chart, the uh, internal diameter of 26 is uh, compatible with a 29 millimeter um, sapient tree. Uh, this very interesting simulation by FEOPS uh, of the confirm our our uh, choice. Uh, this is the kind of simulation is extremely important because for the comprehension of the mechanical impact uh, and the mechanical interaction between the uh, THV that we implant in the, in the, the, the um, bioprosthesis. Uh, basically, this is the situation. Uh, this, this, over, this, this slide overlap the imaging of the um, sapient tree completely expanded. The height of the sapient tree completely expanded is 22.5. The mosaic metronic 29, as mentioned before, is 20.5. The level of the anchoring is at the same ring, so the, uh, the, the skirt should be placed at exactly at the level of the, of the seven ring. But uh, the sapient tree crimp at the moment of the inflation is uh, height uh, 31. So we have to expect for a shortening during the procedure of 8.5 millimeters. And we have to take into account that the foreshortening will occur from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Last step is to evaluate the risk assessment for LVO obstruction. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, evaluate, uh, evaluation of risk uh, of obstruction is based on the CT scan data set, and we have to take into account the outro, uh, orthomitral angle that is, should be more than 110 degrees, and the estimated narrow level of the area that uh, should be more than 170 millimeters square. Uh, our patient, in our patient, the uh, orthomitral angle is 110. It's exactly off limits. And uh, the neo area is 179. Uh, it's a, a borderline case. It's a very challenging case because the anatomy, because uh, the low risk of uh, obstruction. The simulation by FEOPS is more optimistic about the LVO risk of obstruction. So we decided for a, um, for a trans transeptal uh, approach uh, with a sapient tree uh, this slide lists the main step of the procedure. First, to take the main venous femoral assess in the right side, uh, of the, in the right side because it's easier to do the transeptal puncture. Second, uh, venous femoral uh, for the pacemaker in the left side. Uh, we take one arterial assess to, to monitorize the, the hemodynamic for the patient. Then we do the transeptal puncture. We give the complete heparin dose, and uh, then we cross the MVOP with the Agilis plus a pick take, and we plus two pre-shaped stiffs while uh, in the left ventricle. Usually, we use the Safari extra small. Uh, and a sheet is advanced over one of the two wires, the second wire keep in position. Uh, the, then we advance the um, sapient tree and uh, we cross the septum, we cross the, the, the valve, and uh, during rapid pacing, 120 IPM, uh, we deploy the valve. We don't need of severe uh, or, or um, high frequency of the um, rapid pacing because the, the aim is not to stop the blood flow, but is to reduce the systolic movement of the bioprosthesis during the placement. Okay, let's move. In the cat lab, the transeptal uh, puncture is the first critical step. 
we need uh, to do the uh, septal puncture in the inferior posterior part of the fossa valis. Uh, the, usually, the, the, um, this step is eco-guided. We use the bicaval and uh, the short axis view that uh, provides us the correct position of the, of the needle. Uh, we see that the, the needle is oriented anteriorly. This is not a good sign. Uh, because uh, all the systems will tend to go to uh, the aortic valve. Then we advance uh, a deflectable catheter. In this case, we use an agilis in the left atrium. And taking advantage of the orientability of this catheter, uh, we, we try to advance a pigtail in the left ventricle. Sometimes you have to, to manipulate the catheter under echo and the floral guidance. I suggest you to keep one eye on the floral, the other eye on the, on the echo view, and uh, uh, you deflect the catheter in order to uh, uh, look for the right direction to uh, the, uh, the, the, the biopostasis that is in this position. Okay? Uh, the, this surgical view of the echo is extremely helpful to guide your hands. Uh, we are posterior, we try to move anterior, and we are just in front of the valve, and we are crossing the bioprosthesis. Uh, please, look at the tortuosity of the, of the trajectory of the, of the, of the pigtail, and uh, that will be a problem during the uh, procedure, um, during the valve advancement. We remove the steerable catheter, we keep the two wires in the left ventricle, and uh, the e-sheet is advanced over one of the two wires. The second wire remains in the left ventricle, and uh, the proximal part is uh, next to the e-sheet in the femoral vein. We advance a 12 diameter balloon at the level of the septum. We dilate the septum. Then we advance the balloon partially inflated in the left ventricle. This step is extremely important because we have to check that uh, the safari wire is not trapped in the subvalvular annulus. You prepare the valve as usually, but take care that the sinus skirt of the THV is oriented proximally uh, toward the pusher according to the blood flow direction. Is, this is the mitral position of the sapient tree. We advance the valve, as usually. Uh, we prepare, the, we upload the, the balloon on the, on the sapient tree. And uh, after the valve preparation, we have to turn the manifold in order that the uh, Edward logo is facing down. And the flash port is far from the operator. Uh, this is important because when you give the flex, you will facilitate the orientation of the uh, sapient tree towards the septum. And we advance at the level of the septum, and we have the first problem. Uh, the sapient tree doesn't cross the septum. Doesn't cross the septum, the echo is clear. It doesn't cross the septum because it's not oriented orthogonal, but is, uh, the, the angle is not favorable. Uh, we advance the sheet in order to uh, improve the support without success. At this point, uh, we have to decide what to do. Uh, not over push, it's, it's, it doesn't need, but to decide for a different strategy. Uh, I, okay, we decide for the uh, body balloon technique. We advanced a 12 balloon at the level of the sapient tree. Uh, low inflation, uh, low pressure inflation, and you have discussed with your team in order to have a good synchronization, and when your colleague deflates the balloon, you push gently the sapient tree, and you advance it in the left atrium. The role of the balloon is not to dilate the hole. The role of the balloon is to change the trajectory of the sapient tree. And uh, uh, we have a similar problem uh, when we, uh, we try to advance the sapient tree inside the bioprosthesis. Because the angle between the, the, between the, the, the delivery system and the main axis of the uh, bioprosthesis is not favorable. Uh, we decide to use the same strategy. We advance the same balloon and we 
performed slow and small inflation in order to change the direction of the, of the sapient tree and to detach the noscom of the sapient tree from, that is in contact with the ring of the um, bioprosthesis and uh, if necessary to withdraw just a few millimeters the pusher and uh, as you can see is the pressure of the, uh, of, is the, the, is the balloon that push the uh, sapient tree inside the uh, bioprosthesis. Now the distal edge of the um, sapient tree is at the level of the three markers. Uh, check carefully before the inflation that you have the three markers of the bioprosthesis in, in the same line before the inflation. Check with the echo the correct position of the device. Oh, the, the, the sapient tree is uh, perfectly aligned with the three markers, even though the alignment between the main axis of the bioprosthesis and the main axis of the uh, sapient tree is not perfect. But no problem. It's important that you inflate very, very slowly. Okay, this is the position. You start with a rapid pacing. If you inflate very, very slowly, the doggy bone shapes of the balloon will tend to improve the alignment between the main axis of the bioprosthesis and the main axis of the uh, sapient tree. You inflate very, very slowly. When the uh, stent touch one of the post, you can go fast and inflate as usually for five seconds. Then you deflate. You remove the balloon and you keep the wire in the left ventricle. You check with the echo if everything is fine. You remove the stiff wire using a, a pigtail or another diagnostic catheter and uh, you evaluate it with the echo. As we see, no regurgitation, uh, no transmetral gradient. Sergio, we have two, minute, two minutes left. I, I finished. And uh, this very nice um, surgical view of the uh, mitral um, bioprosthesis placed inside the, um, the sapient tree placed inside the, 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 the bioprosthesis is a, a great satisfaction uh, of the old effort done. Uh, at the question, what do we need to manage a challenging case? Uh, my answer is uh, a good understanding of uh, the bioprosthesis technology size and the fluoroscopic aspect and the previous surgical operation. Uh, know the patient, the anatomy of the patient. Uh, planning carefully the procedure, uh, design it step by step, identification of possible contraindication, evaluate the risk of complication, and use the multimodality multi imaging, CT, uh, fluoro, advanced analysis like uh, we show the simulating computation simulating analysis, use only CMR approved on based on my experience, the success of the matrix value transept of Aminval is in 50% the planning, the screening, and in 50% the uh, uh, guidance, uh, correct uh, realization of the procedure in CAT lab. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Sergio. So that's a great case, and that's an awful lot to cover in the time. And, and I think it's down to me now to wrap up the session, because we're out of time. I know you've been interacting. Your questions will be answered by our expert chatmaster, Victoria Delgado. So don't worry about, about that. But I, I'd like to thank my, my co-faculty members joining me here, uh, and Jorg uh, online as well, and also thank uh, Victoria for her work with the chat. I think we've covered a lot. So there's almost too much to summarize, but I think David set the scene with hemodynamics and the fact we got a lot to learn. We look forward to David's data as it comes out of his studies. We learned about tips and tricks about aortic valve in valve, and I thought we saw an absolutely beautiful and very brave uh, case of valve in valve, which we've all learned from. Uh, and then finally, some of the tips about this very tricky procedure, which really took some persuading to get that, that sapien over, but a very beautiful result in the end. Uh, with some of the aspects. I think one of the key themes running through is planning and imaging, the importance of imaging, predicting complications before they, happening, before they happen rather than dealing with them when they do happen. So it's down to me to thank you all for participating in the chat. Thank you to my, to my colleagues, uh, and I wish you a, a very educative uh, London Valve Live both today and tomorrow. Thanks again. <laughs>